Hi. Have you ever dreamt to go back in time when you were a teenager or a child, for example? Well, on some days I look at my body and guess I would not mind. <laughs> Now, for many different reasons, people seem to nourish this fantasy. We wish we could repair uh, old mistakes, uh, seize uh, lost opportunities, uh, recapture the youth, uh, the vigor of our youth. And yet, at the same time, the idea of giving up all the knowledge, wisdom, and experiences we have accumulated during a lifetime make this proposal maybe a less attractive. Because who really wants to start from scratch? Well, today's reading from the Gospel according to John somehow raises that question. And if I can take a few seconds here, during the next few weeks in our church, we will read text from this biblical text. And you probably have heard it, but I just want to remind you that John's gospel is completely different from the other three ones. If Matthew, Mark, and Luke is based on a chronology and a logical succession of events, uh, it's not the case in John. The fourth gospel is all about images, metaphors, Uh, symbolism. It presents a different view of the world, a different understanding of discipleship, a different theology about Jesus the Christ. So for these reasons and some others, we should never read this text from a literal point of view. Okay, let's go back to this morning passage, John chapter 3. A Pharisee named Nicodemus comes at night to see Jesus. And right here, we have the first clue to understand this story. Because the gospel according to John began with a prologue, stating that the Son, Christ, is the light of all people, the light that shines through darkness. In chapter 8, same, same gospel, Jesus says this famous, I am the light of the world. Nicodemus, so remember this, Nicodemus comes at night, he's in the darkness, to meet Jesus, who is the light. And they don't see, they don't understand each other. Darkness, light, light, darkness. Are you still with me? Okay. So our Pharisees call, still call Jesus rabbi uh, because they acknowledge him as someone sent by God. No one can do these things you do apart from the presence of God, he says. Jesus seems to agree and then decides to push this, his conversation with Nicodemus a step further. If Nicodemus really want to see and understand those signs and to capture the essence of the kingdom of God, he has to be born from above or born anew. Both expressions are good depending on the translation of the Bible you prefer. Being born again. Here's an expression that carries a lot of baggage these days. It is often associated with a certain brand of Christianity that claim that one must come to Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior in order to be safe. And it's also used by other individuals, it seems especially by American politicians who want to salvage their career. You know, I cheated on my wife, I lied to the public, I defrauded the government, but all of this does not matter anymore because I'm born again, I'm the new man, vote for me. We have heard it. But this is not how Nicodemus reacted to Jesus' statement. No, in fact, his answer is often presented as naive, uh, dumb, or simply stupid. 
How can someone be born after being grown? How can someone enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born, he asked. Okay, I'm a man, and maybe I should not comment on this specific topic because obviously I never gave birth or even witnessing it. However, I believe I can imagine the technical difficulty to this suggestion. You know, personally, I was a 10 pounds baby, yes. And if she was still alive, my mother would never have took me back, not in a million years, so. Now, Nicodemus' apparent confusion, I don't know, may be based on the literal understanding of Jesus' words, like too many Christians these days, who remain stuck at one level of thinking and cannot see beyond it. Or maybe he cannot grasp how can one go back in time because every living creature Every living creature in this world, I would say, follow the same linear progression. We are born, we grow up, we become adult, we grow old, we die. And no one can escape this natural order, even if we try it. Or maybe we should see Nicodemus as another man who need to be touched and enlightened by Jesus, the light of the world. And as I was reflecting on this text, I wondered, what if, what if Nicodemus really understand Jesus and what is at stake? What if, like any man, he tried to diffuse this situation with a little joke? Because according to Jesus, in order to see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus has to be reborn, to begin a new life, which imply logically the dying of the current one. To increase his relationship with God, he's asked you to start over by setting aside all his assumption and certainties about faith and religion. He's invited to break away from all his privileges, uh, positions, status he accumulated during his lifetime. And obviously, this is not an appealing proposal, proposal for Nicodemus. You see, he's a decent man. He, he had his good life. He studied and worked hard to get where he is. He's a respected religious figure in his community. He's a leader of his people who work hard to improve the condition of this community under the harsh rule of the Roman Empire. So why on earth... Nicodemus, sorry, Nicodemus want to lose all of this and begin a new life? Why would he want to let go of everything he gained through his life? Why would he want to become dependent on others, like, like a child, like a baby, not knowing who he should trust? Why would he embrace this hardship willingly? Good question. And if we want to be truly honest with ourselves, we have to ask ourselves the same question because we're not that different from the Kadimis. Through the years, multiple events and experience, both positive and neg negative, taught us something, help us to grow, uh, to gain knowledge, to mature. And with time, we have reached a certain level of comfort. We establish our place in community. We have learned to appreciate stability. And when we think we have figured it out about life, especially about God and religion, we are told to think again, to reconsider our positions, to reevaluate the basis of our faith and spirituality. Hmm. In theory, we're not necessarily against this invitation. But for sure, we don't want to start from the beginning. We don't want to go back to Sunday school. We don't want to create some sort of commotion, struggle, disruption that could turn everything upside down. 
We don't want to lose everything we have built across the age. Between the status quo that is far from being perfect and the unknown, we hesitate. We continue to often the same pattern. We hold on to the same view that might not necessarily match with today's world. We cling to this current situation in order to avoid change. As I'm recording this message, we are March the 8th, the International Women's Day. And if some wonder in 2020 why we still need it, well, only a hundred years ago, women in Canada were not considered persons, according to the law. Women could not vote in the province of Quebec. Women could not keep their names. There's an anecdote in my wife's uh, family. In the 1970s, 50 years or so, my mother-in-law had to provide a urine sample at the hospital. And when she discovered it was her husband's name on the little container, she was furious and she refused to do it. It was her sample, it should be her name. But that was not what the law required. So across the years, women fought to change society. On course, they were told that their demands were too extreme, too radical, too unsettling. They were accused of leading everyone to an unknown direction. The proposal would upset an order that was working quite fine. Their demand would mean to end the way of life and begin a new one. Sometimes we're stuck at the same place. Sometimes we don't even notice it. We sustain outdated patterns and behaviors out of routine, lack of imagination. And most often, the only way forward is a leap of faith. We're asked to have the courage to venture in uncharted territories. We are invited to put everything on the table and see what emerge. We are called to grow spiritually and religiously by valuing relationship and experience over doctrine and dogma. And when we think that we finally have it for good, we are challenged once again to go a little further to accept maybe, they be, maybe to be uncomfortable and to be open to the, uh, the potential of deep and profound transformation. Maybe the greatest constancy in the whole universe is change. We can embrace it, we can be afraid of it, nevertheless, it's always there. This is the choice Nicodemus had to face during his conversation with Jesus. Did he want to cling to everything he had? Or did he want to discover something new? And in the same way, same question are asked to all of us at least once, if not many times in our lifetime. So are we ready to put ourselves in dangers? Are we ready to embrace new understanding, new realities, new options? Are we ready to challenge what is comfortable in our faith and our spirituality in order to discover unsuspected ways to be in relationship with God? Do we want to remain in the darkness by night or walk in the light of Jesus? The choice is ours. Thanks be to God and amen.